मलाई अडियोमा बोलाइ दिनु भिडियो मेरो आउन सकेन भने टेकिन फर्म भोगी जस्तो छ ओके सम्राट जी यस वी आर अ वेट somebody's phone is ringing can you please mute so which phone is ringing over there can you mute okay let's go live now all right gpk kerala foundation america coordinated this uh, live uh, global live journalist conference and here is priya saman moderator of this conference today i i'm somnath rimire president of gpk kerala foundation america we welcome you all Good morning everyone. My name is Priya Saman and I'm honored to be moderating this panel. This is not a new topic but one that gains more relevance during the time of a uh, global crisis and during a time which everyone battles with the recovery from the pandemic we are currently facing today. While the world lacked preparedness on the handling of corona crisis fake news became about corona became a second pandemic fake news is not a new thing it's been about it's been a part of our history for a very long time it was also known as yellow journalism it became a widely used term during the 2016 us presidential campaign today while the world is facing uh, the crisis who has labeled the spread of fake news as an outbreak on this outbreak as an infodemic with that i would like to open this panel with honorable uh, sujatha koirala ji uh, who is thank you a former deputy prime minister and the foreign minister of nepal sujatha ji thank you very much for joining us from nepal so yeah, for, greetings uh, thank you greetings so, uh, to everyone So, as uh, Sujatha ji, my question to you is: In countries like Nepal, where the use of internet is growing rapidly, and uh, people rely on social media for getting their information, what steps is is the government taking to tackle the threats that social media posts from the fake news? well greetings to everyone thank you for joining this very important session what we face today is the fast spreading of fake news and uh, whether technology is aiding the spread of false news or it can be used to combat the spread of fake news now social media as i understand has occupied our attention influenced our thinking and shaped style of working social media is in high gear it has become the yeah. fastest means of like dissemination of any information while transparency is the soul of any democratic society a free flow of information is of vital importance to establish accountability social media has become a very important that there are increasing calls to fight anyone with wallets rather than bullets can you hear me yes we can yeah we have to be aware of social media it makes life messier and fake social media destroys gratitude and uh, even uh, like as you said world health organization was mired in controversies this has provoked a torrent of nationalist commentary online world strong men use technology to spread their influence weak have no means and style to use the technology in their favor it is here again the poor and weak suffer at the hands of strong that's what is happening in nepal we have to consider this aspect also the weak suffer and we should try to make the fair application of technology and make it inclusive at all level we have to be careful that social media is also used to weaken public confidence in democracy like 
what is happening in Nepal now, and in turn towards uh, authoritarianism. The use of internet is growing in Nepal. In 2011, only 9% of Nepal's population used the internet. The percentage is growing since then, and in 2017, it was about 63%. It has increased in 2018 and further in 2019. This figure too increased in 2018. People are now taking internet as the basic service of their life, but still uh, internet service uh, is not available in uh, villages in far remote areas. And especially at this time of uh, global, uh, it is, um, uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, the school children, they are the one who are suffering a lot. They cannot uh, use uh, online system. They don't have internet connection, no digital system in their school. So um, the government is trying to do to um, promote more uh, this digital system in villages, but that is not uh, enough. And uh, I think the, uh, we are trying to uh, uh, like encourage uh, like institutions like, uh, like our foundation and uh, or other NGOs, you know, to support this inter wireless internet uh, all over Nepal. So everybody has the access to it. So I'm very um, glad to meet you all, talk to you all, and I'm more interested to hear from you and listen from you. Uh, thank you. I just came back from parliament. We had a very, very long session today from morning till now. And uh, so I, I, I'm more interested to listen uh, to all of you, what you have to say. Thank you. So the best practices can be adopted, right? So that's the whole purpose. We learn from each other and then, you know, we, yes. we do whatever best comes out yeah, of it. Exactly. So my uh, next question is to Amina Ji. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us from Mauritius. Um, I was, while I was trying to uh, put up this panel, I was uh, reading some uh, news articles uh, that had specifically spoken about Mauritius. And I read that a man was arrested after he falsely claimed that riots had erupted after the prime minister announced the close of supermarkets uh, and shops. And a woman uh, who had published a sarcastic meme about uh, you know, the, the government uh, closing or something was uh, arrested because of the spread of the fake news. So my question to you is, what measure is the government of Mauritius taking to ensure that the freedom of speech and expression of the citizens is protected while the regulatory uh, measures uh, to control the spread of such misinformation is implemented. Um, thank you very much, Priya. And um, thanking, th uh, thank you for inviting me to join this panel. And as you said, rightly so, it's a conversation that must be maintained and sustained. So as precisely to encounter the, the scourge of fake news, but as costs, as you have rightly said again, countries' elections and even the lives of innocent people on issues ranging from ideology, religion, amongst other issues. But I think the question we have to ask ourselves, how did we get there? Fake news, I think, is a symptom of deeper structural problems in our societies and media environments. Social media, as has been said by the previous speaker, is empowering people who, who were never heard before and is creating a new form of politics and turning traditional news corporation inside out. So that century old craft, as we call it journalism, is in danger of being lost. And this has happened, we must also bear this in mind, only over the past 20 years. So the new, the new news that is replacing journalism is here to stay, unfortunately, and not just changing the face of journalism, but also the very concept of authority and power. And as the previous speaker had just mentioned about uh, the, the age, uh, the median age, for those accessing news from print, 6% of young people between the age bracket of 18 to 24, they access news on print, whereas 65% relied online and social media. 
And in fact, the World Economic Forum has also identified among the top perils of society alongside cybercrime and climate change is precisely the spread of misinformation. So granted, fabricated information has always existed. What is new in this contemporary version tendency to spread globally and at an extraordinary pace? So we have seen clickbait headline, made up stories typically spread faster than the well rehearsed than the well researched articles of established news channels. And what is most disturbing, as you have rightly said, is not so much the amount of fake news on social media, but where it is purposely directed. And it is increasingly being said now that, you know, truth lives in a gated community, whereas fake news is everywhere. And I think part of the problem, the underlying problem of fake news is the fact that the big tech companies have appropriated and monopolized the online advertising market. And this has led to as pay as you go business model in which advertisers are only charged when the page is viewed and clicked. So people are and earning from clicks. So this ensures that social media companies have no incentive to playing the role of our arbiters of truth. So seen from this perspective, proposed anti-fake news law focus on the trees rather than the forest. So as such, this will not only remain irrelevant, but will also aggravate the root cause fueling the fake news phenomenon. And as you all know, market in sensational, conspiratorial and alarmist junk seem to thrive in inverse proportion to the fortune of all media houses plodding through the path of traditional reporting. How are we faring in Mauritius? You know, we have Article 12 of our Constitution of the Republic of Mauritius. It talks about freedom of, of, ex of expression. And this is in line, of course, as we all know, with Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948, immediately after the Second World War. So alongside the freedom of expression I, as enshrined by the Constitution, we also have the Data Protection Act, which protects people's right to privacy. However, in Mauritius, we still do not have the Freedom of Information Act, which would, in my opinion, complement the Data Protection Act. And Freedom of Information Act grants the public access to information processed by government agencies unless the information falls into a category that is specifically excluded from the terms of legislation. So government officials, as we speak, they still have to sign the Official Secrets Act. And also, we do not have a press council as operators have verged on self-regulation. So I am a bit doubtful when, when you know, companies and corporations propose to self-regulate. If you don't have a press council, I think we are where we are in terms of, of, of damage that can happen. So in the era of internet and in 2001, the Information and Communication Technology Act was proclaimed to provide for regulation and also to provide for the democratization of information, communication technologies and related matters. And as you have rightly mentioned again, there have been two incidents uh, recently, but you know, the ICT Act covers most of the provided information services and the breach of that act was, is are hefty fines. And they can go as much as 1 million Mauritian rupees, which would turn out to be something like, uh, I think, uh, 30,000 US dollars and imprisonment as well. But what happened in 2018 is also significant. There has been a modification in the ICT Act with the purported view of protecting against fake news. Now, what happened is that this new provision would make it an offense to post any message, whether in the form of speech or sound, data, et cetera, et cetera. And what's the writing here is quite interesting, and I think this should be open for debate as well, is that a form or combination of form that is likely to cause or cause annoyance, humiliation, inconvenience, distress, or anxiety to any person. Now, this amendment went far as removing the burden of the plaintiff to prove that the intention of the user was to cause annoyance. Now the penalties, as you know, are very high and now they can go up to 10 years imprisonment. Some can argue that this will deter the spread of fake news, but others are seeing it as a mean to silence critics or settle score with opponents or anyone who can get arrested, as you have said, through the posting of even satires on public personalities. So where does freedom of information stop and where does the law start 
you know, from where it starts. So I think this can open a window if we adopt this kind of, of legislation. It can be a window, yes, for preventing the spread of fake news, but at the same time, as we have seen elsewhere, and I think we have seen this with the pandemic, how much of our civil liberties do we give up for the common good? So these are questions that we can debate. How do we address fake news? Do we address it through state intervention? I think many countries have, have done this. Are we going to see emerging a minister of truth? Who is going to be the arbiter of truth? Are we going to make social media platform liable to third, third content for circulation, exactly as what Germany has tried to do? And I think France also went down to the same route. And they've had, of course, established that they have to have within 24 hours, remove obviously illegal content and all the rest of it. Or is online disinformation a complex phenomenon that regulators have yet to master? Therefore, it is too soon to create a regulation that can be effective. Nonetheless, something has to be done. And I think some tech companies, some tech owners, they are trying to what is called sampling fake news with the truth. So instead of killing the story, what they're trying to do is surround, it, surround the story with related articles so as to provide more context and alternative views to the reader. In other words, the social platform hosting the disputed news alters the content in which that story is presented and consumed. So this is what Facebook is now testing, what we call swamping approach on a voluntary basis, but it could be mandated by law across virtually all social network. And we have seen recently how Twitter has also trying to fact check uh, some of the president of the United States tweet. So I think all these remain open to the way we're going to proceed to actually counter fake news, but we agree that it is something which is much deeper than just posting a meme or just uh, you know what, presenting something in some form. I think there's much more to it than meets the eye. And I think we have to start looking at the fundamentals as to why people are doing it. And also how do we uh, ensure the freedom of what people have enjoyed, the freedom of expression? How we got all these are enshrined in the constitution. I'm sure even in the United States, they will start looking at all these because you know, Amendment One, Amendment Two, I think Amendment Two, they actually you know enshrine also freedom of expression. This is also very true in France, where you know freedom of expression is enshrined in the constitution, you can't touch it. So all these will remain to be debated because just countering it with the law is not going to help. So we can come back on all these afterwards. Thank you. This is really great. I, I really liked what you said that truth lies in the gated communities and fake news is everywhere. And then you brought about up about data because data is key in all of this. With that, I would like to pose my next question to Nidhi Kumar. Uh, Nidhi, if you can please unmute yourself. Um, so Nithi, my question to you is, you, you are known to the world, you're the, the face of, um, you host the celebrity show on the Doordarshan, which is the India's, uh, it's the government of India run channel. Um, what I want to ask you is fake news and data privacy issues have always existed, right? Then why are we talking about it now? And why there is so much attention in the media about it? Yeah, hi and namaste uh, to everybody. So uh, firstly, I'd like to say what I feel fake news. Nidhi, you muted yourself. Now, is that okay now? Yeah, we can hear you, thank you. Yeah, okay. Namaste uh, to everybody. And I'd like to begin with saying uh, that fake news has now become a part of our system globally. And as you rightly said, during these lockdown times, during these COVID times, uh, people need to realize what are the statistics and figures of uh, COVID cases, for example, in India and in the world. But uh, let's understand here uh, that it is, I would like to add to Amina Ji's answer and say, it is user generated content, 60 to 70% of that is that. Now this content falls under a, a platform 
where there's a lot of dissemination happening of information through smartphones, through the internet, becoming so accessible and affordable, right? The landscape of traditional media is changing in India as well. And though these technologies allow the audiences to experience a new sense of transparency and accessibility, leading to mushrooming of a lot of propaganda news. Now, propaganda in the sense, uh, ma'am mentioned article, uh, uh, you know, uh, to privacy. In India, it is article 21. And the minute uh, the government makes any kind of noise or says, you know, that uh, we need to look at this holistically and we need to stop this, uh, there's a lot of things uh, that go around even in India saying that this is an attack on our privacy and should not be allowed. And that I'm sure happens everywhere. We also know while we speak, uh, Priya, and uh, who better than you, you were handling Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign, that uh, it, uh, the village in uh, Minnesota or Macedonia uh, led to the you know elections. So all that, it comes into various categories, whether it is propaganda news, whether it is fake news, what can we do about the fact that we become the judge, jury, and executioner all on ourselves? If you outrage, and if a rape is reported, for example, on social media, and uh, there, there is no whataboutism of, of the whole thing. There is a WhatsApp university that is running in 100 countries as we speak. My question to everybody is, what does India do if, if the news is coming, say, across from the border? All these people who are earning money through the social media platforms need to be held accountable since they're earning money. They better take responsibility. I can go on a reverse Google search and see who started that news. So it's not difficult for them. It is interesting to note as we speak that Twitter has removed a lot of bots, you know, they are uh, who were uh, pretending to be uh, humans uh, from, um, it, it took them three years, but they're now doing it. And uh, we need to follow these kind of standards so that this efficacy can be questioned. As far as the WhatsApp policy is, do they have an encryption policy in place? Yes. Are we holding them accountable? No. What are the steps that technology needs to take? There is AI in everything that we speak. What are we doing? What measures are you and I taking? One measure could be that the government takes in the mainstream media and all the channels and also the editor's guild and hold the person who's heading that guild responsible for any kind of content that is damaging that is fake, that can cause any kind of lynching, any kind of, uh, you know, um, a mass protest. We had this incident in America very recently where people were asked to protest everywhere. So, and also talking of cyber crime. So, ye guna mein bhoat vridhi aai hai Bharat mein bhi. And this menace uh, needs to be uh, changing. We need to look at this whole landscape um, because consciousness of people is also increasing and this is one of my favorite points during this lockdown times so many malices in society are thankfully being recognized you and i are talking about it all of us are talking about it and uh, we're challenging the same fake news is one such racket which is slowly coming under the scanner but we need to fix it together we need to fix it holistically and as uh, the program unfolds I will, of course, put in my suggestions to fix this holistically. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nidhi. I just want to correct your one uh, point that I did not manage Hillary Clinton's campaign. I was advisor member to her tech and innovation policy. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I stand corrected on that. <laughs> but you got my point, right? Yes, yes, I did. I, I'm you. correct on that, yeah. <laughs> so uh, my next question is to Andrea. Uh, Andrea, thank you so much for joining us from Spain. Thank so you so what, much for having me. So what measure is your country taking uh, in implementing, uh, you know, laws and rules and, uh, and initiatives to counter the false news? And as a journalist, uh, how are you su supporting those efforts? Well, first of all, uh, let me thank you again, because it's a privilege to be able to participate to participate today here in this conference with all of you. 
uh, well, in Spain, in my country, the mass media are divided by their political ideologies and they alter the information in a way that does not harm their personal interest. There is no neutrality on Spanish journalism, just as there is no neutrality in our government. Now they are trying to establish new censorships using fake news as a pretext, since everything that comes to light does not favor them, is categorized just in fake news. And I believe it's not so complicated to identify a fake news, since fake news are created with the interest of manipulating the masses. They are always written with the objective of generating fear, causing vulnerability. And everything is left uncertain without clarifying any position or a scenario and always causing a void, always favoring only one sector, and there are always loosens. Uh, I consider that a defect in a Spanish journalism is that it's loaded with sensationalism. And this takes away their credibility when it comes to giving news. So I personally support much more the independent journalists of my countries, the journalists who go on their own by pure vocation and who are not limited when it comes to exposing a new story. These journalists practically depend on the internet platforms to make themselves known, and they are frequently being censored and, catalog and cataloged like fake news, ignoring their sources. The sources who are the most important thing we should be looking at when it's about recognizing fake news. And these independent journalists, they are not supported by any economic sector. They are not financially supported by any political party or private companies or organizations. So what it's needed is neutral and reliable journalism. That's very necessary. And not only in Spain, I believe in all over the world, because we have to be very aware of what is generating the news when we are giving them. And that's basically all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, I think some there's a lot of echo coming if, um, yeah, thank you so much. So um, my next question is going to be uh, to Dr. Uh, Dahal. Uh, can you please unmute yourself? So Dr. Dahal, uh, fake news is not only happening in the world of politics, um, brands, and sometimes uh, small businesses are also targeted because of this. I mean, we have so many use cases um, to talk about uh, on this platform. So as a former member of academia, uh, how do you think uh, brands can cope up with uh, fake news to uh, protect their reputations and identity? Uh, Dr. Dahal, can you please unmute yourself? I think, is there any technical difficulty? Um, I think I'll, I'll come back to uh, Dr. Dahal later. Maybe he's having some technical difficulties. So uh, next question, I'm gonna go with Priyanka. No, Dr. Dahal is here. I can see him, but um, he is muted. So um, I need to record his response. Um, I just want to uh, go ahead with uh, the panel and I'll come back to him uh, once you know he's able to figure out his uh, technical uh, issues. So, uh, so Priyanka, you are an alum of uh, Obama campaign and um, I, I, and also founder of um, a very, um, you know, uh, uh, known platform on YouTube, the New India Junction. I mean, I um, took a look at it and I was so, so impressed by what that platform has to offer. Um, so, um, your platform is catering uh, to the change makers who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. Okay, and during the Obama era in 2008, um, you know, uh, there were so many change makers who, who came on the campaign as youth and now are, you know, they, are, they have become the leaders and you're one of them. And um, I know that uh, Obama campaign and the world knows that uh, Obama campaign changed the way um, the politics and the political elections are uh, you know, done. Okay. 
So they use the power of social media for both their 20, 2008 campaign as well as 2012 campaign. While fake news was not widely used term then, uh, can you please share how misinformation was flagged and managed during the campaign? Because it was there and it was more on rise because you know of his um, heritage. You know. So can you please share some light on that? Yeah, first of all, namaste. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here amongst all these distinguished guests. And thank you for the question, Priya. Um, I think that uh, I was involved in both of the campaigns, 2008 and 2012. Uh, 2008, I was actually an intern for his campaign because I was still in college. So he was still a senator back then. And uh, then he announced his uh, bid for presidency. And then, of course, he became a presidential candidate. So he worked on his election campaign. 2012, I was a, a more um, active and more senior person on his national campaign. And you're right, as you said, fake news was existent. Now, I think the main thing, and I worked on his, uh, on the communication side of things, uh, on both campaigns. Uh, the main difference that, that I found and that the entire team found, uh, and this is very similar to the Narendra Modi campaign as well, because he was the first prime minister to use social media to the extent that he did. And his campaign has a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of case studies online, a lot of similarities between uh, uh, President or former President Obama's campaign and PM Modi's campaign in terms of social media usage. Now, the one difference that I noticed between his uh, two campaigns, despite misinformation being a part of both campaigns, was that social media, and he was very heavy on social media, social media platforms specifically, when you look at them, when you look at Facebook, when you look at Instagram, uh, when you look at something like Snapchat as well, which started off, you know, I remember downloading Snapchat when I was a consultant and my coworkers and I would send silly pictures to each other when we were bored. That's how the platform started. So primarily these platforms started as just networking platforms and communication platforms. But today, if you look at these platforms, the same ones, including Snapchat, including Facebook, from Instagram, any platform that you download, it has a news tenet to it. They have become media platforms as well. You can get all your news on Facebook. You can consume all your news on Instagram. You can consume all the daily headlines on something like Instagram or Snapchat. And this is the major difference. And since they are now part of media, and since they have that media anger to it, and since so many people are consuming media on social media platforms versus turning on their television and going to the news channels or mainstream media, uh, mainstream media has also converted uh, pages on social media, in fact. So there is so much information, there's such a plethora of information that in 2008, it was well under control because by and large, misinformation were on these traditional websites, traditional news stories, traditional articles. But now you have uh, anything from videos to snaps to uh, uh, something uh, that India is just getting the hang of, which the USA has already gotten the hang of, which is citizen journalism, where anybody like me, for example, anybody can just start a YouTube channel for free and say what they want to say. And if it's convincing enough, and if the editing is good, it could be plausible, right? Now, I don't do that, <laughs> but uh, a lot of people do. And uh, as uh, Amina Ji said before, it is uh, clickbait. They do it for just getting the views, just getting the hits, because that's what gives them the bread and butter. So that is the major difference that I have seen. And it is a problem. You know, I worked a little bit on the uh, Narendra Modi election as well. And uh, there was a survey that came out, I believe, in 2019 that said that 88%, I spoke to youth especially, uh, in, from tier one major metros to tier three. Uh, and I say tier three because it does still exist in India. And that's a cold hard fact uh, and to rural India. The one commonality was that they all had smartphones. So even young people were consuming information. Now, what they told me was, you know, we asked them, do you feel fake news is a problem? Because literacy is also a problem in India. So a lot of them did not know how to read. They asked, you know, I asked them, well, do you feel that fake news is a problem? And how do you decipher between what's real, what's fake. And they just basically said, you know, Priyanka, Priyanka, madam, we don't know, we, we're not sure, we the, what we consume, what comes on our phone is what we sit and watch. So what I think, and I think Amina Ji, you were coming to, uh, or Amina ma'am, sorry, you were coming to the, the uh, sort of debate 
about what is needed. I think there's a very unique problem, especially in India, that did not does not really exist in the United States because literacy rates are high. But because there is no literacy, there's also a difference between social media literacy as well. So what I think is firstly needed in India are these, whether it's a national uh, or a state implemented platform, whether it's a private or NGO implemented platform, platforms are needed to teach people to decipher between fake news and non fake news. And this sort of education is needed from anywhere, anyone from youth, uh, because a 14 year old, I mean, my nieces consume news on uh, Instagram as well. They're very aware of issues. And at 14, I was not so aware of these issues. Uh, and I was always a politics buff. So um, I think that people are very well informed. It's just that they need to know how to interpret the plethora of information that is coming. And that is what India really needs, whether it's state implemented or whether it's privately implemented. Thank you. So um, I have a follow-up question to you because you said you cater to the youth. So yeah. how is uh, a new uh, India Junction helping in combating the fake news? Because you know, right now with what's happening in, in India, especially, I mean, there are so many issues. We would like yeah. to uh, learn more about it. And uh, it's great that you know, you're empowering youth so that they can make informed decisions between what is uh, correct versus false. Right. So my channel, uh, I basically started and I was uh, in the US before. Uh, Priya, I was in your backyard in Boston. Um, I graduated Harvard in 2018 and decided to move to India um, versus staying in the US and, and working there. Uh, because I really felt, uh, as Andrea said before, media is very polarized. Here, you, I feel that you cannot be middle of the road, which is something you can be in the US, right? Like you can be middle of the road. It, uh, you don't have to be completely Democrat. You don't have to be completely Republican. You can vote little left one way, little right the other way, right? But here, I feel in terms of media, especially mainstream media, I think, Andrea, you probably the same thing in Spain. It is very polarized. Uh, so you're either all the way here or you're all the way there. And um, I think that this is one major problem that I saw in India, that especially among the youth who wanted to debate, because as I said, Priya, before, they are very well informed. They want to talk about these issues. They want guidance on these issues. You know, how should we take this further? Uh, and it's very difficult to do so when you're just getting one side of the story. Uh, and these youth are unwilling to consume news that is very far left if they are on the right hand side, or that is very far right if they are on the left hand side. There's very few sources that give objective, credible information. Uh, so that's what my channel intended to do. We wanted to, uh, it, it uh, highlights positive development across India. Uh, it started out as just kind of getting ground realities uh, of people, what they thought on election issues, but it's turned into a full-fledged YouTube channel. Uh, we did an answer to John Oliver. Um, we did uh, sort of answers back to things that I feel are very polarized, uh, things that have come out as fake. Uh, in mainstream media and those have done really well and they've been very well appreciated um, and I'm surprised honestly that I'm one of the only people in this country who's doing that I think uh, Nidhi ji you can probably agree with me that there's very few people doing that because of the amount of trolling that we face on a day-to-day -day basis so uh, I mean if you're able to you know haters are haters gonna hate right that's the that's the phrase so I guess if you can stand that uh, then you just keep going and do your thing but I do feel it's very important that uh, youth especially get to know the truth and the objective truth. That's what media is all about and it's the fourth pillar of democracy. So someone's got to do it. Yes, and you, you're doing it right. So kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I, see, I see Dr. Dahal here. Uh, Dr. Dahal, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, we are, you, you're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So uh, my question to you is, um, uh, fake news is not only in politics, right? Um, it's all over. Brands and sometimes small businesses are also um, targeted. So as a former, a former member of academia, uh, how do you think brands can cope up uh, with fake news to protect their brand and identity? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, moderator, for uh, giving me this opportunity to address this. But first of all, I would like to uh, thank and highly appreciate Somnaji for providing us this opportunity and express our views independently. We are independent journalists, I believe in. 
and uh, Sujata Kurela, she mustn't be here, but I thank her too for uh, her uh, welcoming address. And thank you all the panelists for your uh, valuable views and expressions. And as a journalist, uh, let me also speak a few things, but uh, I think that's not the right question to me. I would like to request you to put this question to any other panelist because I'm not the right person to address that. But what I would like to tell you now is- uh, I will actually ask you because, you know, from a, as a professor, I thought that question would be, um, you know, answerable. But my question to you then as a journalist is, I'll, I'll pose it to you, is, uh, uh, you know, news comes from all sides. It comes from print, it comes uh, from online. The dilemma is for any journalist is what is fake versus what is accurate. So as a journalist, how do you take care of the thing that you know it is not in the interest of one group, but it's whatever is shared is in the interest of a public? Right, yeah, that's the right question to me, yes. Uh, now I got your point, okay? Because sometimes uh, what happens is that fabricated information or misinformation lead people. Like if you can see the news of USA during the elections, mainly in the elections of Obama, Barack Obama, that there was a news spread all over that he was born in Kenya, which was not true. Later, he proved it that he was born in USA in Hawaii, that was proven. Likewise, now, if you can see the recent topic, I would prefer to talk about the conflicts, that the border conflicts in between India and China. You know that from the Times Immemorial, there is a very nice friendship between the people of Nepal and India. But now the media people for their vested interest, because of yellow journalism, they have said that the land belong to Nepal. And some of the journalists, they said the land belongs to India. The land which I am talking about is Lipule, Kalapani, and Limpiadura. So what we need to do is we need to go to the fact because there was a rumor that uh, that uh, Anupam Kher, the actor, he was speaking in favor of Nepal, which is not in fact true. And again, some of the journalists of India, they have been saying that Monisha, she walks the actress, the Bollywood actress Monisha, she acts, in Nepal, she lives in India, but she speaks for Nepal. So she has trying the journalists, some of the journalists, so-called journalists, I would rather say, they have been trying to defame Monisha's fame. So this is called yellow journalism. So what they do is, for their vested interest, maybe for the political interest or maybe for the uh, media house interest, they speak in favor of somebody to enrage them, to put fire in them. So what I think that the brand or the media houses, what they do with the help of some big media houses, what they do is they just uh, mislead people and they give the false information to the people. And if you can't verify them, if you can't research them, then people tend to believe it and they come on the street. They started putting fire on the tire and the friendship, it goes to a wrong path. So what I mean to say that we need to stop it the soonest possible we can. Thank you so very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Dahil. Uh, so my next question is going to be no, to Navdeep. Um, the uh, rapid spread of fake news um, can influence millions of people, impacting elections and financial markets. You have been a media strategist uh, for India's largest political party. What are some of the use cases that, that you can share with us? Um, thank you. Thank you, PRG. So, uh, namaskar, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, PRG and the GPK Foundation for uh, organizing this talk in fake news. I think it's a very relevant topic considering the current scenario. Mainly because I think that uh, most of us have been a victim of fake news at some of the other points, as the Honorable President also pointed out. Therefore, it uh, not only becomes a duty, but a moral ob obligation to not get used to living with it, but to address the situation as effectively as possible. So, uh, coming to your question, uh, first I'd like to talk a little about the technical aspects of fake news. And uh, I'll uh, conclude by giving you a recent example of its use in the Indian political landscape. Uh, so talking about the technical aspects of fake news from a campaign strategist uh, point of view, uh, as far as I'm concerned, fake news is uh, nothing but strategic messaging, which is a message crafted to uh, suit its influencing factor rather than doing its original job of uh, presenting the facts. And uh, of course, it's very damaging in certain cases, which I have uh, personally experienced in my career. Uh, for example, uh, you know, as I think one of the panelists also pointed out, how private organizations uh, are using it to sell bad or uh, maybe not so useful products. You know, um, another example is can be for the government. Uh, you know, how they use it for achieving the desired response on its upcoming policy roll out, I mean, you know, which might not be so beneficial for its citizens. But at the same time, if you look at uh, 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 its more positive side, it's also uh, being used to bring about awareness on important uh, social issues, such as global warming. For example, uh, due to these awareness campaigns, uh, now we are more careful about wasting water or to make sure to switch off the lights when they're not in use. So, of course, there are more po both positive and uh, negative aspects uh, depending upon its use. So, coming to how it's done from the technical point of view, of course, it's a very complicated exercise and is only possible if one has access to large number of personalized data sets. And, uh, you know, these data sets, if they are closely analyzed, of course, using certain tools and algorithms can reveal almost anything and everything about an individual starting from their political preferences, religious beliefs, habits, economic status, I mean, to the extent that it can even reveal your uh, current emotional state. So uh, with every opportunity, uh, I, I think comes a responsibility. And uh, that is exactly the reason why we have to make sure that we use all the available resources for the betterment of our society. Now, coming to the uh, 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 second aspect of my answer, which is its uh, 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 recent use in the Indian political landscape. I'm sure uh, all of you must have heard about the recent uh, uh, anti-CAA protest uh, in India, which uh, left at least most of us completely clueless about why exactly these protests even occurred to begin with. So, I mean, let's look at this uh, manufactured political chaos uh, courtesy fake news. So you must be aware that uh, CAA's main objective was to uh, give citizenship to the minorities living in India who uh, fled from their country of origin, namely Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, uh, and Afghanistan because of the continuous persecution they faced due to their respective faith or uh, religious belief system. Now, some people ask, why only minorities? Well, the reason is simple because the, the majority, which is Muslim in these three neighboring countries, is obviously not persecuted due to their faith or uh, religion in an officially declared Islamic Republic. For example, uh, the, the minorities living in Pakistan during the partition was about 15%, and the numbers have come down to 1.6% now. In Bangladesh, 
from 26% it's come down to 8 and a half percent and in afghanistan from 250000 it's come down to 1000 now the first thought uh, which will come to all of us is what happened to these people like where did they disappear and uh, i mean that to in such large numbers you know. of course they were forcefully converted uh, and uh, if they didn't agree to the conversion they were slaughtered and the ones who remained rightfully decided to run away to save their life now the ones who fled and came to india most of them did not have economic strength to take care of themselves and their families and neither were they entitled to any of the state or central government welfare schemes because to avail these schemes one has to be a citizen first therefore it became imperative for the government of india to grant them citizenship as soon as possible so they can go about their lives and get an opportunity to uh, live like normal citizens so uh, this what caa was all about just giving citizenship to the persecuted minorities already living in india now coming to how this issue was misconstrued using fake news by a certain lobby in india and their friends in the western media is uh, something which most of us found to be extremely shock shocking i'll i'll quickly give you two examples from uh, news giants like the telegraph and the guardian uh, so there was a, an article by the telegraph in the month of december uh, last year which uh, reads it is the latest in the string of actions the government led by the hindu nationalist bharatiya janata party has taken against india's muslim population the guardian reads violent clashes continue in india over the new citizenship bill protests spread to delhi as bjp government is accused of making muslims as second class citizens now what does the caa have anything to do with muslims of india as it is clearly stated in the act that it is it has nothing to do with the existing citizens the act clearly talks about the persecuted minority living in india and awaiting their confirmation on citizenship so either they didn't bother to read the act or purposely tried to misguide the world with an intent of damaging the image of india therefore i will conclude my answer by saying that the seed uh, that was sown during this entire malicious campaign using a tool like strategic messaging was that modi led bjp government is anti muslim and the narrative which they tried to grow out of it was that india lacks religious freedom and democratic democratic rights for its minorities which is then unfortunately supported by some institutes like us cirs to give it a, to give a malicious campaign like this more credibility therefore i think uh, that there is a much bigger propaganda machinery at work to take on growing in global influence sir like india and unfortunately they are able to lure away some home grown uh, support using the vast sum of resources they possess uh, of course this is just one of the many incidents uh, which took place recently and there are many more which i would uh, like to talk about but of course due to the time limit i'll close my answer here but uh, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, you've given uh this is really great what you just shared with us because you know being here many of us from the indian diaspora uh you know who have their own opinions but you know can make a decision and a debate about you know what they see and what the ground reality is um somebody who is there working on the ground getting a perspective also helps a lot with what what actually is happening so with that my next question is it all you know this all is spread and everything happens is because of the power of the technology so i have a, a ceo of a, a, a technology consortium uh, with us uh, geo uh, thank you so much for joining us so see consumer facing brands political parties governments non governmental organizations are all keeping a vigilant watch especially now on the spread of fake news as a chairman of a technology startups that um, uh, focuses on developing innovative products um, how do you think technology can address our misinformation problem 
Um, so, Priya, thank you for moderating this outstanding panel and uh, Somnaji for assembling such a group. Um, you know, great opinions, uh, and I can see how the technology question is a very loaded question. So, as maybe the sole uh, party on the technology side on this panel, um, I'll take the responsibility of stepping up. So, as you're asking this, I was trying to think about if I asked this question to my 12 year old son, right? And I asked him, um, what do you think, uh, do you think video games are good, right? And uh, you guys probably can, um, you know, venture a guess at what his answer would be. Um, but that's the root of the question, right? How do we use technology, right? That, that, that comes down to it. So, um, so a little bit about, um, our perspective. So I run a consortium of startups and we're focused on um, different aspects of technology, but a couple of the platforms we work on are uh, one's called ElectAid. So think of it as a non-creepy um, Cambridge Analytica uh, type uh, to help with elections. Um, uh, GovernAid, which is for um, can be for governing bodies, um, large public utilities, um, water authorities to utilize uh, social media and other digital aspects to better serve their constituents, right? Um, and then Brand Ally, which uh, is about uh, protecting and growing um, a personal brand or a company brand. In all of these, um, the legitimacy of information is key, right? So, so we're involved in this space of how do you legitimize whether it's news or just information that's floating around in social media. So um, we were um, privileged to be part of a um, European Commission had um, uh, put together a, a group to in investigate and look into deep fakes, right? So um, the overwhelming percent you know, one of the, uh, I won't go through the details, but, but, but the uh, overarching issue uh, comes from uh, which uh, one of the other panelists alluded to is AI bots, right? The propagation of AI bots and how they're utilized to spread uh, deep fakes or fake news. Um, the, 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 the problem is there. Now, how do you uh, wean out AI bots? Actually, uh, there are multiple ways of doing that. But more than that is um, in social media companies, right? But when they initially were created, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, WhatsApp, um, the, the idea was social, right? And then quickly humans figured out a way to commercialize it and globalize it. And then right behind it, uh, not just someone, but a lot of people said, hey, this is a great way to, you know, disseminate information, but unfortunately, good as well as bad, right? So um, identifying AI bots and shutting them down, actually, I applaud a lot of the social media companies, they've been working on it, and they're stepping up now to shut down and identify and shut down um, uh, AI bots on deep fakes. The bigger concern is shallow fakes, okay? Um, and shallow fakes are such that they're not just AI bots, they are morphed. So, you know, this is something that we are more involved in. So, um, so there are methods. You, you have to triangulate a lot of information, the rate at which information is propagated, uh, how it's disseminated, and you take all of this data and you start triangulating and actually you use the power of the people on social media to figure out what news is fake. So it is possible to do this. It takes a lot more technology and effort to do it. Now, um, when we talk about, you know, uh, technology, um, can technology solve this issue? Um, I really go back to this is not a technology issue as much as a human abuse of technology, right? So when, as a technologist and a human-centered developer of technology, we, we have to look at it this way, right? Uh, we have to think about it first as a human, 
and then approach it as a technologist, right? Um, abuse is always going to be there, but, uh, and, and you can build in some safeguards, but, you know, I, I, I'm hearing ideas already from the different panelists about how we can go about it. And I will assure you, um, representing the millions of technologists, um, <laughs> not us, there are going to be others that will come up with solutions that will help this. So hopeful is always as the technologists are. So thank you. So now we are at 11.32, but I, I want to go with all the speakers uh, with a second question that I have, I think, and then I want to open, I want to give the audience a chance to also ask a question before I give my uh, concluding remarks. So um, the second question is more from a human perspective, okay, because at the end of the day, we all are human beings. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's more going to be towards compassion and empathy and, you know, from that perspective. So we all come, uh, so I will start with Sujata ji. Uh, this question uh, is to you and then, you know, we'll go um, uh, with the same uh, uh, lineup that we had, is that we all come across uh, fake news in our daily lives. What, if anything, in our personal role, I mean, what, if anything, is our personal role or responsibility in this cycle and how can we make sure that we are helping to make truth louder? Are you on mute? You're on mute. Uh, thank you, Priya ji, for giving me a time to share some thoughts with you all. Uh, now I have, uh, you know, I have to tell you a little bit more about uh, Nepal. I forgot last time a little bit. Uh, Nepal has high level of mobile telephone and around 60% of the mobile users are using data for the internet connection. Besides mobile data, a large number of people are using internet from their home or from office. This has created a great space for information dissemination. People are more aware that the information is at their reach or even in the fingertips. On the other hand, some misguided people are using these resources to propagate hate among the people or using their wrong views to the society. And um, so uh, Nepal's uh, constitution has guaranteed for freedom of speech and also guaranteed for press freedom. No one, will be, no one will be persecuted for his or her speech except the provision of hate speech or against public disorder, which are generally mentioned in other countries' uh, legal system. So you are right that we all come across fake news in our daily lives. It is not any individual responsibility, but the users, basically wrong users of social media need to be making responsible. Uh, many countries have system to deal such kind of uh, unruly uh, use of media. Uh, therefore, the social media users should be make aware of the wrong use of social media and its legal consequences. Similarly, the government should protect the privacy of any individual. And um, in Nepal, we, we are also facing a lot, especially, you know, political people like us, we face a lot of, uh, lot of uh, problem, uh, uh, giving, uh, you know, character assassination is very severe here and uh, abusing through media and cyber crime. Recently, I complained to the police about cyber crime on my news or about myself, you know, we, I have uh, suffered from all this media, um, cyber crimes and wrong news, spreading of wrong news in the society, destabilizing the society, uh, you know, uh, the, and uh, weakening the democracy which we have fought for so long, the Pali Congress, our party, our history, all throughout we fought for the democracy. And now we have uh, Republican Nepal. Uh, we have, uh, we, the king used to rule Nepal, but now we have uh, uh, Republican Nepal and uh, no king's rule. 
And uh, we also are uh, victimized with uh, this fake news and media. And we have to really uh, have a lot of discussions internationally with all media people, also learn from each other how, how we can um, you know, uh, protect ourselves, our people, our country uh, from, uh, from the abuse of uh, some fake news and some, some media. I wouldn't say all like independent media. There are independent media like uh, one uh, Andrea, Mrs. Andrea Wen uh, said, which is we can use also independent media. We can encourage them, perhaps. And uh, but uh, these these are the problem we have to face, and we have to try to uh, solve, uh, bring some kind of a solution to solve this problem. Thank you. So, um, Amina, ma'am, what's, what's your thought on this? Um, thank you uh, very much, Priya. You know, um, this issue here, there is, uh, for us, uh, I think, uh, well, I want to say us here, I speak about the women folk. I will come back to this very quickly. There is a huge economic uh, issue, which is linked to uh, clicks, as we know, right? People's reputation destroyed. We're living in a very mercantile world where earning is much more important than just trying to get to the truth. So that's one reality we have to live up to that, you know, there is a huge commercial aspect of it. Of course, sens sensation sells. There's no doubt about that. Now, if we were to actually promote truth uh, in this era of fake news, there are two ways. If you, if you know already the website, I think you have to go into a digital literacy to check and to promote that and to check whether this website is credible. Then you'll know whether the news is credible because I think increasingly a lot of these uh, very, very strange websites which actually uh, circulate all these news uh, are coming out. And the other thing, if you're getting something on other social media platforms like WhatsApp, you know, and you know, all, the, all the other that go with it, I think if you're not sure about the identity or whatever is being shared, I think one has to stop and think and check before sharing. Now, WhatsApp has limited it to five people that start sharing, but at some point, just at one click, you just have a group of, and you just go on. Messenger is still there with about 50 or 45, whatever it is in terms of numbers. So I think our responsibility to actually contain this, this infodemic, as you have rightly said in the very beginning of, Spreading fake news is first of all to go and check the veracity of what is being said. Then it's only then that you share it if it's going to add to anything of, 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 of use, if it's going to add to sharing proper information. And you rightly said, when during the pandemic, I've seen all sorts of recipes going around, and you know that it is not going to help the cause. So I think it's the responsibility of the person not to share this kind of fake news. If it is a website, go and check. And I think as academic, as mentors, we have the responsibility to ensure the people have this digital literacy before they start sharing this. Now, the other thing about women folk, I mean, I have to make this point all the time and I make it all the time. The women are increasingly being demonized on social media and mounting all sorts of images and circulating all these around to demonize women, to actually blackmail women that's also becoming a, a, a norm nowadays on social media. So again, this is a plea we have to make to men folk when they're getting these images, be responsible, do not share it left, right and center. It could be leading to somebody's suicide. It could be here helping destroy a family or a woman's life or something. And this is something we have to wake up to, to, this, to this narrative as well. Please let us not share blindly the information. Let us check the veracity of whatever is coming in our in our phone or in our computers before we start sharing. Thank you. Nidhi, what's your what's your take on this? You're on mute. Yeah. Um, to add to what Amina Ji said, I would uh, say the same thing and I'd uh, like to take Nabdeep's point also and uh, Priyanka's forward here. 
that uh, we need to identify the veracity of the news. We need to verify it before we forward it because there are tons of reliable, trusted and very reputable sources of news. Also, what you said, compassion, empathy, especially during these times, I would add to that, that let's look at honest news. Let's be honest with ourselves. Hum, samaj pe, uh, kya responsibility hamari hai as Samaj? Hum sarkar pe to akraman kar dete hai ekdam se aur keh dete hai ki aapne ye nahi kiya, you're policing too much content. We need to monitor that content as citizens is my point. We need to look at it more holistically and see whether we are forwarding the right kind of thing. And I'd also like to add to what she said uh, that there is, as we speak, um, let me share the statistics. Uh, they are very alarming, but 90% uh, of India watches porn. Now, what is happening in uh, what is this leading to as far as our Gen Next is concerned? What are they watching? Have we ever thought about what they are watching? What kind of policing we need to do to protect our children is my question. Look at the kind of mental stress and depression that is going to be happening post-COVID times. We need to look at that. And to add to what Navdeep said about the CAA, I'd like to add even the migrant crisis that was shown by many uh, WhatsApp forwards was not the correct thing because the government did its bit. And uh, uh, the the um, uh, various people, Samaj jo uthke aaya tha in logon ki madad karne ke liye, usse hum aur achhe tarike se dikha sakte the. What I'm trying to say is, let's look at the picture more holistically. Let's look at the good. We need to do that as citizens. We need to take a call there, and we need to say that all right, this much and no further. This much policing and no further. And we need to understand and even report it to the authorities that this data we feel has been paid or this is paid news or this is propaganda news and we need to put a stop at it. This is very important for the very fabric of India. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. So, Andrea, what's your take on this? Well, just like the other panelists have said before, I absolutely agree with them. Uh, but I believe that first we need to ask ourselves, what is the root of every fake news? Like, why people do even do this? There's always a reason behind. There's an interest there, whether it's money, economical money, as others have said, economical reasons, or the control of the masses, what kind of impact do you want to make on the people? Because uh, as I stated earlier, we must use discernment to identify the fake news and be able to observe that there are always loose ends. Uh, in what way technology has contributed a lot in bringing many truths to the surface and reaching every part of the world because now even, even the poorest countries have internet connection, but uh, as the other panelists said before, maybe it's the human abuse of technology and not technology the problem because it's it's wonderful the fact that everybody can get the information, but what are we doing with it? Uh, the, I believe that we should promote more awareness because the fact that anyone can use this technology puts fake news on everyone's mouth. And I do not see technology as a threat, but I do see the risk and as soon as something becomes public, everybody assumes that it's true just because it's public gets to be true. So more consciousness and prudence should be promoted to combat, to combat fake news. Uh, invite people to question everything, everything. Even when we are writing something, always invite people to think twice. They must question everything because nowadays you cannot trust any, any source. Now anything is reliable as it used to be in the past. So that's basically everything. Thank you. Priyanka, would you like to shed some light? Yeah, these are all really, really excellent points. So just to briefly add on to it, um, I think when we're looking at, since we're all living in a post-COVID or COVID world right now, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi wrote a letter on LinkedIn that really uh, I could relate to, uh, and he appealed to youth, especially and working professionals, pretty much all of us here, 
uh, because we're all in positions of either working or leadership uh, or influence. I think that he said, you know, try to find ways to digitize and try. This is because this is what the economy is going to be henceforward. I have no doubt that the economy will bounce back all over the world. Uh, we've dealt with pandemics before and it has bounced back. I think what needs to be done, though, as we go forward is not just look at how to digitize in terms of work, but also how to digitize and how to make sort of a regulation policy uh, and uh, probably a policy that uh, uh, you know penalizes people or institutions for spreading fake news. I think that this needs to be done. Uh, the other thing that I kind of think is very, very important, especially for you, uh, you know, it's very easy to, and I do this on my YouTube channel all the time, uh, it's very easy to educate youth on what is fake news, what is real news. And a very easy thing that you can do is I reached out to people on Twitter. I reached out to influencers on Instagram that that I admire and uh, who, who I feel are uh, you know great at reporting news. And I asked them, hey, what sources do you look at? Uh, what are the uh, channels that you follow? So any youth that, that is watching over here, I encourage you guys to do that because people are more than happy to help. And I really do want to stress this point about women. And I was really glad that it was brought up. And I don't think it's just women. I think that a lot of journalists, you know, if you don't mind, Priya, I, I would like to read a message that I just received. Um, and, uh, you know, I think so, some of you can probably relate to it. Uh, this was a direct message on my Facebook. How does it feel to be a human behaving worse than an animal? You, ma'am, are a true waste of education, resources, and space on Earth. Kill yourself. This was a, a private message that I received. Um, I received tens of thousands of these, hundreds of these messages every single day. And when we're talking about issues like depression, when we're talking about issues, you know, sometimes these messages do get to you. You wonder why you're doing the thing that you do and why you should go on. And I think that the solution to this is to actually call them out. So what I did was I just cropped the messages and I tweeted it out uh, to all of my followers. And I said, you know, so-and-so, I've got these messages. Uh, you know, objective criticism is okay. And objective criticism on my work and on my videos are fine. And what I write, that's fine. I can take that. But harassment is not. Uh, so I think, you know, don't be afraid to tweet it out or to put it out there that, look, this is what's happening in my inbox, if you don't believe me. And you'll get a lot of support. I was really happy with the, uh, the men and the women that came together that, that supported me and uh, you know, gave me really positive messages, both personally and on my social media platforms. So I encourage you to do that, especially since, uh, and working professionals and everyone to do that, uh, especially since we are going into a time where digitization and, and dependence on uh, online is going to be the new norm. Thank you. So now, Deep, what do you think on this? What's your take? Uh, you're on mute. Yes, uh, so, uh, of course, uh, there has to be a multi pronged approach and a long term strategy to uh, curb fake news. But uh, due to its complex nature, and of course, as we have seen, wide, uh, its wide area of influence, I think uh, that the most proactive approach can be by the governments to uh, regulate a dissemination policy and ask, especially all the large media organizations, you know to dedicate a certain percentage of their capital towards fighting dissem dissemination from their own portal. And to make sure that it's put to use, the government should ask these organizations to submit monthly reports so uh, that it comes uh, under a legal framework. And I think uh, uh, the, uh, this is the only way uh, one can uh, legally fight this. And governments have to take a more proactive approach uh, but, uh, you know, there is one problem, uh, which is that the moment government uh, initiates an approach like this, the, the, again, the media bandwagon, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, a section which is completely against uh, uh, the pro-Indian policy, starts, uh, uh, you know, having the same song, which is that you're trying to curb the media freedom. So uh, it's, uh, it's it's going to be a, a very it's a very tricky situation, but uh, if you ask me, the only solution is to put uh, dissemination policies in place and monthly reports. I think this was also 
uh, uh, suggested by uh, EU's uh, foreign policy director, I think if I remember correctly, Joseph uh, Borrell, uh, for uh, 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 you know uh, portals like Facebook and Twitter. So if this can be done, I think it will be very proactive. And Gio, you? What, what, what is your take on this? Sorry about that. I was engrossed in all the conversations. Uh, so um, I, I was actually taking notes, uh, great points. So uh, I think uh, Amina Mam brought this up, uh, Priyanka kind of echoed it. Um, so the, the use of mobile technology spread, right? It, it's only going to increase. Um, I'm confident from a technology standpoint, deep fakes, we're gonna find a solution. Uh, and actually, technically we found the solution. It's implementing it, right? Um, we know that um, there will be solutions like, um, I, I mean, part of what we look at is if you have a social media post or a stream, there will be an option for you to click on the legitimacy, meaning it's not just fact check, it's just the source's um, legitimacy, right? So it gives that person a way to say, okay, this is, you know, 50% legit. This is not really a accredited news agency or has a, um, a historical, um, um, uh, you know, a rating for reporting actual news. So there are a lot of different methodologies. I don't know which ones different social medias will uh, put in place. Um, the, the challenge is shallow fakes, right? So th that one, it will morph. But again, it'll, it's, a, it's a hide and seek kind of game. The technologists and humans in general will be after it. Uh, policy is important, right? Um, again, policy is it's a tough, it, it, it's the censorship versus the other line that you have to um, try to navigate through. But I think there's a, there's a, um, there needs to be that political will initiative and governmental oversight, but not overstepping it. Um, so we are uh, part of a, a, a large organization called um, uh, the Digital Economist and uh, which is about human centered technology. And that's how we kind of approach a lot of our solutions, right? And I'm also lucky to be part of a, a organization called Dream Tech, which is uh, all about Gen Z and Gen Y and youth centered innovations. Um, and, and one of the things uh, when I think about this is really the missing part of the conversation, although we have some representative, is Gen Z and Gen Y, right? The youth need to be part of this conversation because yes, we're doing, we're talking about what is happening now, but very soon it's going to be them, right? We're just going to be bystanders. Everything I build today is for them to scale. And it's more important about how they feel, how they consume, how they fact check. So them being part of this conversation is just as important integrating into it. So, um, so from my perspective, um, you know, we will have solutions, but there are hackers always, and there's going to be people who come up with methodology to do it. And it's the human evolution and the human challenge to keep combating and try to bring truth as much of it to the forefront. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gio. Um, I, I truly feel, see, we are just now what, uh, clo about four months away from the uh, our next election, the presidential election. And since uh, the landscape with this coronavirus is such that we cannot do door to door canvassing at least now, maybe as we come closer to fall, we might, it might open. So technology is the only way we are going to go and how we can mobilize youth to be part of this is, uh, is going to be a game changer. So with that, uh, Somna Ji, um, I would like uh, to give uh, the floor to you uh, is, if there are any questions from the audience because this is also Facebook Live. Uh, and uh, then I will close the panel. So Somna Ji, it's up to you. Thank you. Thank you Priya Ji and thank you all the panelists uh, for your valuable knowledges that you share among us, among globally that 
We can learn a lot, lot and lot. And every day is a learning day. We learn every day, every new thing, especially in this digitalized world. So now I have a first question that has been addressed to Priyanka Deo. News is increasingly sure. threat to political legitimacy and social position. However, some populist leaders around the world are misusing the need of time of, to extend their thumbs in the region, in the rain, in their rule. How do you think modern democracy can come out of the problem successfully? And this question is from Dr. Bharatraj Podel, journalist from Australia. I, uh, Priya, I couldn't get the whole question. So if you okay, um, uh, Somna Ji, there was a lot of echo coming, so she wasn't able to hear. Uh, yeah, one of again. us was able to hear it. So, Priya Ji, Priyanka Ji, how do you think modern democracy can come out of this problem successfully? About the fake news. Even the government, uh, government side and the political leaders are using it as their weapon of uh, for their rule. So how can we successfully That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, I think that it, it obviously differs from uh, democracy to democracy. Um, as I said, you know, India has a very unique problem of number one, literacy rates, uh, and number two, the amount of fake news and platforms and things that are coming up. Uh, that I think is constant in every country. It's not really spared any democracy as such. But I think what we really need to look at are some of the suggestions from my respected panelists here. Uh, number one, I think regulation is needed by a national body. And I do think that in a developing democracy, I strongly believe that it should be state implemented. Uh, you know, for example, we were talking a little bit about the CAA and the Delhi riots um, and the migrant crisis. I think Nidhi, you had, you had mentioned this. Um, you know what the best thing that the Supreme Court could offer because what had happened was we had thousands and thousands of migrants uh, during the national lockdown that uh, gathered right at Anand Vihar, which is a bus station here in Delhi. Um, you know, people were, while the rest of us citizens were sitting at home, you know, these guys, all they wanted to do was go home. And it was a result of misinformation, um, fake narratives. That was the only reason why they were there. So I think in a way, I don't want to say it was a good thing, but the silver lining of this crisis was that people became very aware of fake news. Uh, there was another incident of migrant workers in uh, Mumbai, I believe, that gathered, and the journalist who had put that fake headline out was caught and apprehended and charged. Um, I think that there needs to be more enforcement of penalization for fake news, uh, which only comes with reg uh, sorry, sorry, regulation. And I think that you do have to start inserting, especially at the tier two and tier three levels of countries, uh, especially developing countries. And I, I think the way that you can do this is put it in education curriculums, that along with tech education, uh, as Gio was mentioning before, uh, Gio, so I think that you also need to implement uh, knowledge about social media and how to use it corrected, correctly and how to use it objectively and how to decipher the social media knowledge is very relevant. And I think it should be implemented at this point in time in schools because every student from you know, the first, first grade to, to high school, to college, to grad is on a tech device uh, first and foremost. So I think a democracy can come out of it only when citizens start becoming responsible and that responsibility comes through knowledge. Uh, so however you want to implement this knowledge and teaching how to use social media responsibly, uh, that is the way to go about it. I hope that answered your question. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka Dioji. Now, next question goes to Gio Murikanji. <clears throat> this is from Nepal, Kathmandu, from our brother, Nawaraj Bhattarai. I believe he runs himself an online media. So we have a fact checking website these days on uh, all the online medias online news but are they really fa fact checker how do we find out yeah it's a it's an excellent question right so um, so uh, that's why i said um, when i said that people are working on this or implementing it in our own ways um, 
there needs to be a, a more central standard uh, for doing this. So um, uh, our belief at least is, um, and that's why we work in a consortium is that it's not about my technology and how I implement it for someone. It's about a standard of technology, right? Uh, meaning it's, it's, it's tested by multiple medias. So I would say if someone just sticks something up there that says, hey, this is fact check, uh, I would say, okay, what's the standard? There has to be in, like in, in anything, any industry, any news, you have a standard, right? Some governing body that says, hey, this software, this uh, it has been, you know, this product has been tested. So um, I, I don't know how to perfectly answer your question because I, I would say some of them are doing uh, very legitimate and earnest work, um, but it's a very, very, challenging landscape to to legitimize news right and so um uh i would have to answer and say there needs to be a governing body that looks at these type of things because just like fake news you can come up with a fake fact checker right so so then so technology can be abused that way too so uh i hope that helps answer your question Thank you, Josie. I hope Navara's brother can get that. So this is the last question so far to former president of Mauritius, Honorable Amina Gwildi. Why the media is very low in Mauritius? Why it cannot be coverage or why we don't uh, get to know the media's uh, reportings outside the third world? Can you please uh, brief us? Uh, sorry, you said that uh, you don't hear much about the media uh, out in Mauritius? Yeah, Mauritius uh, outside Third World, uh, all over the, like, globally. Well, I think just as well. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I couldn't resist that. Uh, no, but, you know, we have uh, uh, Google is here. They cover just about everything. And, uh, you know, maybe it's... Um, you know, maybe the, the, the type of the hype that uh, is expected is not coming out of here. But already when Priya introduced, she was very much aware of the people who have been arrested uh, for these fake news. Uh, some, of, some of them, it was not fake news. And I think this is a, there's a case in court right now uh, for whether it was a fake news or it was a satire or a meme. Uh, so this is presently, presently being debated. And I will send you an email later on, Priya, uh, with that person, uh, so that you can liaise with her and decide exactly. But no, I, I think, you know, maybe we're not making the news by virtue of the fact, again, depends on the tier that you're trying to, to reach in terms of sensation. Maybe we're not there just as well. So, <laughs> but definitely uh, these things are, are now catching the headline because it is touching on, as I said, where does uh, the freedom of uh, expression stop and where does the law come in? But I think you're right. I think all the, all the, all the panelists have been, uh, I think unanimous, if I may say so, that we need regulators, we need governments, we need institutions that actually cut across you know, all, all, the, all the hubris that has been going around so that people are served quality information through our, through our tablet, through our phones. And it, it is a very, very powerful weapon, which of course, it's a war out there, right? In, in cyberspace. And we need to protect our children. We need to protect our society. And we need regulators. We need institutions to be there to give us quality news. That's truthful. Thank you, Honorable Abinaji. And just received uh, Ananta Ramji from India to Gurdarshan. Uh, uh, she was there before Nikki. Yeah, she's here. Nida is here. She's here. Yes. So this is for her. Uh, is it true that uh, Prime Minister Modi is following the President Donald Trump's uh, fake news agenda? You're on mute. Nidhi, you're on mute. This is for Nidhi. Yeah. Can't hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. So you got yeah. the question, right? 
So I would not like to comment uh, on who Prime Minister Modi chooses to follow or not. Um, but uh, there was, again, I could uh, silence them by saying that this was indeed a fake uh, news or a fake post. And we need to counter it the same way as we have been, uh, you know, signaling to all our uh, people on a, you know, a very, very pragmatic level today in the discussions. But uh, we need to see that there are no knee-jerk or cosmetic measures that we follow, but we get policy to, you know, um, uh, take on uh, um, uh, uh, the WhatsApp forwards and even uh, uh, the centers of social media like Twitter and all, who choose to say, and I'm going to say this on um, your platform today, thank you for giving me this platform, uh, whenever we hold such people accountable, they navigate their way and say that, all right, we don't, uh, you know, go by the laws of your country. So if you're making money in my country, baby, you better be accountable for that, is what I'm going to say. And I will not comment on the Honorable Prime Minister following whichever handles. They could well be, again, a source of misinformation. Thank you. I hope that answers is good. Thank you. So that's the that's the last person I received. So now Priyaji, just closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing your yes. views. And we we got thank a you. chance to learn and know. So we keep on learning, like I said. So thanks again. So thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Somnaji. Um so you know, hearing all of you. Um former heads of the government, you know, political analysts, uh, uh, social media influencers, independent journalists, tech CEOs. Um, thank you so much. I mean, you brought wealth of knowledge to the time that we had. And, you know, we can go on and on because this is such a uh, pressing issue, uh, which, you know, the entire world is trying to combat. And I personally feel um, that collaboration is key so that you know we can learn from each other um, and follow the best practices um, in the area that we serve. So um, my uh, few thoughts on this would be is that various government agencies are now setting up services uh, to debunk fake news. Journalists and television anchors are following standards and ethics by checking the uh, fact checking the information before they share um, it to the public. Technology companies are using more AI uh, to fight the fake news uh, by killing the AI bots that are already there. Uh, political analysts are also working you know, on, the, in, on the field uh, uh, with their volunteers to make sure that you know, what's happening on, or happening on the ground is reported. However, at the end of the day, it comes down to us, right? the active users of the information and social media. We have to take the responsibility uh, to educate ourselves and our networks, which will help stop spreading the fake news. With that being said, that's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of learnings we will have because, you know, um, as I said earlier, uh, US is heading into uh, the presidential election and there are a lot of models that are going to come. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, papers that will be written. So there's a lot of information that's going to be shared with the world so that we can follow what's the best so that, you know, everything that we do generates the impact and we all the nations grow um, and prosper. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. It was a great honor to have all of you. Uh, thank you so much. Priya, before, uh, before you end, um, I would just like to thank Priya uh, for bringing all this panel together. Um, I'm a technologist myself, and I, I just want to hear everybody's opinion. It was great to hear from all the panel members and a special thanks to Priya Saman Parurekar for arranging all this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I, 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 actually, uh, I actually want to acknowledge, because I still see they are here, 
few of the people who are on the, on this call today with us. Uh, one is the advisor to the India Foundation, Rami Desai, and also our supporting partner, uh, Disha Foundation, uh, Mr. Goswami, who is also here with us. So thank you very much um, to you also for your time. And I see more were there, but I think, um, you know, I think it's late in many parts of the world. So, uh, yeah, thank you. And I would like to acknowledge thank some of you. Uh, Dr. Shibaji Shresh from United Kingdom and Dr. Kamal Dev Bhatrai from uh, Annapurna Post Political Analysis, Analyst from uh, Nepal and Buddhi Sagar Gimire, senior journalist from New Zealand was here. And before we go, we have another global uh, Zoom conference tomorrow uh, regarding investment leadership post COVID-19 about the economic um, come down, you know, uh, economic growth right after the post COVID-19. That will be having the, uh, that uh, live Zoom conference tomorrow at the same time. Please uh, like our Facebook page, GPK Foundation, and we keep posting you, we keep updating you. We do this uh, series of global conference uh, once every week. So far, this is our fourth global Zoom conference. Thank you for part participating. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting you. us. Thank you so much for inviting us. Foundation, uh, Honorable Sujata Koirala, former Deputy Prime Minister and former Foreign Minister of Nepal. She heads our uh, Grija Prasad Koirala Foundation and his central office is in Kathmandu, Nepal. And we have 18 branches all over the world, including uh, United States. That one, I am the president of um, GPK Koirala Foundation America. Thanks again. We look forward seeing you. Uh, can you, uh, Somnabji, can you please tell me tomorrow is what? Uh, pro COVID 19 uh, investment? Yeah, investment leadership pro, uh, post COVID 19. Okay, so I want to thank all of you for your time. Thank you, Priya. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.